Continuing, Avery Pretrial, State of Wisconsin, Circuit Court, Manitowoc County, Branch 1. State of Wisconsin Plaintiff v. Stephen A. Avery, Defendant. Motion Hearing and Arguments Pertaining to Franks, Case Number 05-CF-381, Date August 10, 2006, Before the Honorable Patrick L. Willis, Circuit Court Judge. Appearances, Ken Kratz, Tom Fallon, both Special Prosecutors on behalf of the State of Wisconsin, Dean Strang, Jerome Buting, both Attorneys at Law on behalf of the Defendant. Stephen Avery appears in, in person. Index Arguments of Counsel by Attorney Buting and Attorney Fallon. The Court. At this time, the Court will go back on record before we hear oral arguments from parties on the Franks motion. There's a couple of other things to address. First of all, it's my understanding from discussions with counsel that the parties have, have an agreement on the media statements motion that was filed by the defense and for which testimony has been taken. Is that correct, counsel? Attorney Fallon, yes, that is correct. It is my understanding, and I think counsel would agree, that neither side is conceding the merits of the other side's argument, but in, but in acknowledgment of the overall circumstance of this case and the number of statements at issue, we have reached this following resolution. And that is that the state would agree not to use any of the interview statements obtained by news reporter Cobas, which I believe, if memory serves, were on November 18th and December 14th. And in the exchange for which the defense is withdrawing their request to prohibit our use of any of the statements, either telephonically or in person, obtained by invest investigative reporter Matesic. Again, neither side is conceding the merits of the other side's argument. It's just a concession due to overall circumstances of the case. The Court. Mr. Strang? Attorney Strang. There's nothing about that which I disagree. I will add a little bit I think that matters, and I believe that we're also in agreement on. The Emily Matesic interview was November 12th, as I recall, and the, the jail televised interview, and we are withdrawing our constitutional uh, objection to that, withdrawing the motion insofar as, as that interview goes. And as to the later one later telephonic interview with Ms. 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 Tessick, and I will say that it, it was that it was a straddler that, the, that was sort of midway in between because the motion never was intended to cover the interviews or statements of Mr. Ravy where he initiated the phone, the telephone call. And as I say, that one straddled a little bit because Ms. Matesic initiated in one sense by writing a letter asking Mr. Uh, Mr. Ravy to call. He initiated, initiated in another sense by making the collect call. But in any event, no constitutional objection and the motion is withdrawn as to those two interviews. At this time, I believe the state has not obtained the raw footage of the November 12 interview or any full tape or raw tape, so to speak, of the later telephonic interview with Ms. Mastesic. I know the defense doesn't have those materials, and I think we have to agree to do at this point is just be to table until later questions of completeness. If, in fact, the state is able to obtain raw footage or the full interview, on either of those occasions. Assuming the state is not, we will not object to the introduction of the two minute or two minute plus segments of those interviews that were actually aired in the Matesic interviews. And then I also agree it's simpler as to the Channel 5 or Jennifer Cobas interviews, both in jail, both televised or filmed November 18 and December 14. Those the state will make no use of at all at trial. And again, here each of the two sides is utterly secure in its conviction. The other side is completely wrong on legal matters, on legal merits. So, the court, all right, and a lot of the, the detail involved in your argument here, I'm going to ask you to provide to the court in the form of a written stipulation then, and I will accept it. 
Mr. String, I will have you draft it. And Attorney String, I would be happy to. I would be happy to. The court. When the court receives it, then I will deal with it. With respect to some of the other motions that are pending, because of the lateness of today, I'm still going to be hearing oral arguments. What I'm going to do is set a date for August 22nd, that is Tuesday, at 9 in the morning. And on that date, the court will issue a decision or issue decisions addressing the issues of venue and a trial date, among other things, but also on the most of the other motions that have been heard, and that is either heard or, f or for which briefs have been filed. I understand that some of the motions that were heard over the last couple of days will be dependent on the filing of written briefs and the court reporter generating a transcript. So we may not be in a position to deal with everything on the August 22nd, but certainly the venue and trial date motions and some of the other motions as well. With respect to the concerns raised by the state just before we enter into uh, into break, uh, counsel, it is my understanding that defense court, uh, counsel has discussed more fully than even before with the defendant his right to have provided testimony at these motion hearings over the last couple of days, and it's still the defendant's uh, decision in consultation with counsel to elect not to testify. Mr. String, is that correct? Attorney String, we had Mr. Buting and I had a meeting with Stephen Avery in the Manitowoc County Jail during break. I'm going to guess, I didn't time it, but I'm going to guess the meeting was about 10 to 15 minutes long, something in that neighborhood. It was a private meeting. Law enforcement was not in the room. We were within the, the secure envelope of the jail. And we, we had a two-way discussion about Mr. Avery's opportunity if he chose to testify at the motion, uh, motions hearings and his right to maintain his silence as well and chose not to testify, explained, Mr. Beauty and I explained that these pretrial motions and their strategic uh, questions are at, at least pre predominantly issues committed to a lawyer's judgment. And we explained to him what our judgment was and is on the presentation of evidence of those motions. But this was a two-way discussion, and Mr. Avery, as always, is really very, very cooperative client, someone who's engaged in discussions and cares about his case. And I think he certainly treats us as if he respects us as the two lawyers he chose to defend him in this case. The court. Mr. Avery, do you concur with the summary of your discussion just placed on the record with Mr. String? Mr. Avery, yes. The court. You understand you have the right, if you wanted to, to testify at these hearings, but do, do I take it that you have made the decision in consultation with your attorneys that you elect not to testify at these hearings. Mr. Avery, yes. The court, very well. The court is satisfied that the defendant has been adequately informed by the defense counsel of his right to testify at these hearings and has made a decision in consultation with his attorneys not to testify. With respect to the motion that the court has heard in the last few days, first of all, on the issue of the admissibility of the statements made to Marionette County Sheriff's Department, it's my understanding that the testimony we have heard was fairly limited uh, on those, and the court reporter expect to get it out in short order, and the parties could submit some attendance written briefs by week uh, from tomorrow. Attorney String, yes. The court, both parties in agreement. Attorney Fallon, that's correct, Judge although the record should reflect that the pr preference of the state was to argue it now, but acknowledge th that the acknowledging the decision of the court will have a brief for you at the end of next week. The court, all right, the testimony taken on the issue of effective multiple executions of the search warrant and the motion related to that. I understand that there's a good deal more testimony that, and the parties would like additional time uh, in which to brief that issue. I have spoken to the court reporter. She indicates that she can have a transcript ready in about three weeks. So I'm asking the parties at this time how much time that you would like to submit some of the briefs on, on that issue. So essentially, the transcript will be ready in about the end of the month. Attorney Buting, I could probably do it 10 days after that. The court, okay, how about September 13th? 
uh, it's a Wednesday. Attorney Buting, sure. Attorney Fallon, September 13th. I will check my calendar, please. Right now, my written calendar shows that would be doable. I haven't checked my computer calendar back at the office, so assuming I don't have anything else going on, that's, a, that's doable. The court, all right. We'll say briefs due on 913 on multiple executions issue. And the last matter is the Franks motion. I will hear all arguments at this time on that issue. Since the, there is an initial burden on the defense, I will hear from the defense first. Attorney Buting, thank you, Judge. Perhaps before, before I argued that, though, we did have some discussions off the record with, with counsel for the state that maybe that maybe crystallizes the issue on standing a little bit a little bit better. I don't know if you would like to the state uh, what your position is on where Mr. Avery does or does not have standing. Attorney Fallon, the only thing I would say is that the state hasn't challenged his standing or hasn't contested his standing to challenge a search of his house and the garage and the rest of the uh, rest were prepared to argue. The court. Okay. Attorney Buting, including the, the burn barrel, the burn pit, and the area of his house and garage. That was something that wasn't clear to me. Attorney Fallon, it was clear in our pleadings. And again, the arguments discussions are relative to this particular motion exclusively. Attorney Buting, all right, Judge. As we pointed out in the motion that we filed, the, although, let me talk about the Franks first, and then I'll talk a little bit about standing. And in order to complete my argument on Franks, I want to play for the court the, the second phone call that Detective Remaker had with Investigator Wiegert on the morning of November 5th regarding, regarding the use of or the discussions about whether there was an intent to use volunteers to search every property or not. And if I could play that briefly, then... I will argue from there. I have set up, I have my copy in there. I could put in the original if you like. The court, all right. And this, if I remember correctly, the part of the Detective Remaker's testimony where the jail had tapes. The attorneys went over and listened to them, so there's no question that this is the tape. Both parties agree? Attorney Fallon, I believe so, I believe so. Depending on what we hear, if it is an, a representative represented by counsel, yes, it's a conversation between Detective Remaker and Investigator Wiegert. The court, all right. Mr. Buting? Attorney Buting, there are two phone calls. The first one is more lengthy. It is the second one that is very brief and more of issue in this. The court, is it, uh, is it set up uh, for the second one? Attorney Buting. It is set up and ready for the second one. The court, very well. CD played, Exhibit 20. Detective Remaker, Remaker. Investigator Wigert, yeah. Is it 323 or 373? Detective Remaker, 323. I think this is supposed to say Investigator Wigert. I can't remember fucking reading. Detective Remaker. 32319, the year you were born, 1929. Investigator Wiggert, you got her. Hey, I have a change of plans here. Detective Remaker, okay. Investigator Wiggert, the boss has got something he wants us to do. Detective Remaker, okay. Investigator Wiggert, he wants us to go back over to and re interview Avery and Zipper again. And as long as the search party is out there, he wants us to ask them if they would like, uh, would allow us to have the search party come on their property and go through the junkyard. The search party. Detective Remaker. Okay. Investigator Wiggert. So, if it's okay with you, we'll just meet over there at your sheriff's department. Detective Remaker. Okay. Investigator Wiggert. Talk about it a little bit. And if you're not too busy, Detective Remaker, okay, man, Zipper is not going to be real happy. Investigator Wigger, I'm sure he is not. If he tells us no, he tells us no. 
Detective Remaker. All right. Investigator Weger. Later. Detective Remaker. Okay. Investigator Weger. If you don't mind. Detective Remaker. Yep. It's that's fine. Investigator Weger. We'll stop over. Okay. We'll probably be there. I would say within the hour. Detective Remaker. Okay, give me a call before you get here. I will meet you. Investigator Wigert. Will do. Detective Remaker. Okay. Investigator Wigert. Thanks. Detective Remaker. Bye. Transcribed to the best of my ability. Attorney Buting. That's it, Judge. And I told your court reporter beforehand that it's a little hard sometimes for her to be able to take down what's being said in the CD like that but I wouldn't have any objection to her listening to, if she prepares a transcript on it, have her listening to the court's exhibit, which is exhibit, oh, I'm sorry, 20 for accuracy on the transcription. The court. Okay. Attorney Beauty. The case of Franks versus Delaware says that if an individual who applies for a search warrant, that is, the affiant, in this case, Investigator Wiegert provides false information intentionally or with reckless disregard for the truth, and that information was necessary to establish probable cause. Then the Fourth Amendment requires that the hearing be that a hearing be conducted. If a, if at the hearing it's proved that the false information was presented intentionally or with reckless disregard for the for the truth, then what the court does is set aside that portion of the affidavit and looks to the remainder of the affidavit to see whether probable cause exists. If having struck that portion of the affidavit, probable cause does not anymore exist, then the warrant is that the search warrant must be voided. The warrant is improper. It's our contention in the motion that we filed that Investigator Wigger either deliberately, intentionally, or certainly with reckless disregard, disregard for the truth did just that. In paragraph 5 of the search warrant affidavit that's dated November 5, 2005, it's been made part of the record in particular, Investigator Wigert stated in that affidavit that officers had received information from volunteer searchers that they had located a vehicle matching the description of the vehicle owned by Teresa Halbach. That is the first statement that is, is, it not, is inaccurate, that is incorrect, as I believe also was made part of the record. The transcript of the call from Pamela Sturm makes clear that she did not say that the vehicle matched. In fact, that she indicated that the vehicle color did not appear to be correct or did not appear to be within the same that she had been described or had seen on the flyers that she was following. And that it was, in fact, because of that, she hesitated to say that she thought it was matching the vehicle because she wanted to see the VIN number. And she was calling and asking, do you know the VIN number? Secondly, we also argued that the term volunteer searchers was a bit of a stretch and that we believe the officers used volunteers in such a way or citizens in such a way as to essentially make them part of the police search by trying to engage them in a Fourth Amendment search. Now, in that regard, the motion was based upon statements made in the official Manitowoc County Police Sheriff's Department report of this investigation, which I went over with both Detective Remaker and Investigator Wigert. Investigator Wigert denied making the statement that was in Detective Remaker's report that Detective Remaker attributed to him, in which he stated, Wigert indicated that several searchers were willing to go to the Avery property on Avery Road and to search the junkyard and salvage area. When I put the, the question to Investigator Wigert, he said that Detective Remaker just got it wrong. I didn't say anything about that. I think he said he didn't want he didn't say anything about the volunteers coming to search the junkyard at all. And here's and here's where his credibility in this court at this hearing it is at issue because he didn't know he didn't know at the time, as neither did when he testified that Manitowoc County had actually recorded that conversation. And I played that portion of it right now, in which it's clear he did talk to Detective Remaker about using those volunteer search party in is what is what he calls it to search the Avery junkyard. 
and that, in fact, he was using using volunteers to conduct a search that obviously by that time Mr. Avery was also a person of interest at minimum. Using them to get a consent to try and get in and search would be a very good way to use around Mr. Avery's Fourth Amendment right with regard to privacy and expectations on the search of the Avery family property, and that was recklessly, if not intentionally, misstated in the affidavit. Again, paragraph 5 of the affidavit. The other part of that paragraph that is completely wrong, or nearly completely wrong, Detective Remaker, Detective Remaker himself acknowledged he puts in the affidavit that, I mean Wigert, that Wigert acknowledged he, in fact, put false information or incorrect information in here because he says in his affidavit that the searchers provided the entire VIN number. And when pressed on that matter in court, he had to admit that it's not true. In fact, only a part, a portion of that VIN number, about half, 10 of the 17 numbers, could be provided by the volunteers that they were evidently unable to read the rest of it. Now, the state will probably argue, oh, well, that's just semantics. That's just a mistake. Negligence, at most, is not any kind of reckless disregard for truth. But we have got to think about the timing of this as well. We could talk to Pamela Sturm on the phone about 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning. This is only a matter of a couple of hours later. He's, at most, he's preparing this affidavit. It's facts obviously fresh in his mind. It's clear from the transcripts. There was an extensive discussion, extensive discussion with Pamela Sturm about how many numbers she could read in or on the VIN number, on the VIN. And it's very clear as you look at the transcripts or all or of that 911 call or whatever you want to call it, that there's a back and forth, can read this, well, I'm not sure about that number, might be a T, might be a 1. Very clear that she did not have the full VIN number. And yet here, within a couple of hours or so, he's saying in this affidavit to the court that, that the searchers not only found a vehicle that matched the description, but that, that had, had a VIN number, a complete VIN number, that matched. And that's a very big difference in my mind, in the court's mind, I'm sure, I'm sure it is. Because if, if you're trying to get probable cause for a warrant, it's much, much easier to do so if you mislead the court and tell them, hey, there's a vehicle these searchers found, and it matches the description that was given uh, for Teresa Hallbach's vehicle. And not only that, they checked the VIN number, and it's, com and it's completely a match, all 17 numbers. Very easy to get a probable cause with something like that. It's another matter if they get to point out the truth. If we was to point out the truth to the court, which is that, well, we only have a partial VIN number. There, and there is some hesitation on the part of the caller, the searcher, as to whether this really matches or not. And in cross-examination, I believe it was, uh, Attorney Fallon was having was uh, having Investigator Wigert point out all these other facts that he knew, such as whether the model matched, whether there was a sticker on it from the Lemur Toyota, uh, all these other facts. But the point is not what he knew in his mind. The point is what he provided to the independent reviewer, the court. And he does not say anything in this affidavit about the model year or any comments that Pamela Sturge said about that or any of his subsequent investigation about whether or not there's, there, other, there were other reasons to believe that the vehicle might have matched. He skipped over all that. He just assumed for himself that he could call it a match and that he could tell the court that these volunteer searchers believed it to be a match rather than telling them the full truth which was, which is something very less than, than that. If, in fact, the information that's left out or not, or deliberately not included was reckless or reckless disregard for the truth, then the first couple of sentences in paragraph 5 will be struck or stricken. The only, the only other, and frankly, the only other part of the paragraph that supplies for probable cause is Investigator Remaker. Once he got to the scene, it says Investigator Remaker was able to confirm that the, the VIN number, and then it lists all 17, is the correct number for the Teresa Hallbox Toyota RAV4. And then he talks about the investigator Remaker's visual observation. And then here we get to the point of whether or not Detective Remaker was in a place where he can make, lawfully make those observations, such that they could be considered by the court. 
in the search warrant. If not, then it has to be struck as well, stricken from this affidavit. And without paragraph 5, there is not probable cause. I can spend some time on that later if there's really any dispute about it. But there, but there's not probable cause in this affidavit if you can take par if you take paragraph five out, plain and simple. So the question uh, then is, at this point anyway, did Detective Rimmaker have a right to be on the in position that he was to go up to the vehicle and read the VIN number on it? Was he lawfully there? Were, were his observations lawful? And does and that does involve questions of standing as whether Mr. Avery might have a reason to have an expectation of privacy as well. So let me let, let me address those two points. First of all, the testimony said or established that Detective Remaker did not have consent from anybody on that property at the time when he came up to the RAV4 and I believe shined his flashlight on it or whatever in order to try and read the VIN number. And the testimony from Pamela Sturm was that she had gotten uh, consent holding herself out to be a volunteer but not a police officer. And so that consent would clearly not carry over to the police as well. There's also some testimony that later Earl Avery supposedly gave consent to the officers to be there, but that was, I think, uh, I think the record was 1117. That was a good five or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I think, after Detective Remaker arrived at the scene. Earl Avery, when testified, in fact, denied that he ever gave consent he said the officers made him sit around for three hours, never talked to him until then. They just had him have their way with it. I don't think that there can be any serious argument that there was and that but that part of the property was simply open to the public access and that, that none of the Averys would have any expectation of privacy in that area, the southeast quarter quadrant of their property. Testimony was from Earl Avery. He marked on Exhibit 18, where the public is generally allowed not allowed and not allowed without permission. And the custom and practice is that they drive up to the front of the office, they come in, and they say, do you have a part for this or, or that car? And then they are allowed to go in, sometimes with, with supervision, sometimes without, and to go into the yard. But only with permission that they, I think that's Earl's words, absolutely not, is the public allowed to just go in there without, into the pit, into the junkyard area without permission. Other facts which indicate a reasonable expectation of privacy were testified today by Lieutenant Sippel. He talked about how there's fence lines around the property on the north, east, I'm sorry, north and east edge, yes, and that there are berms, one of them very high, on the east edge and 10 or 15 or so 10 to 15 feet on the south edge, which would clearly indicate that someone is trying to demark that property as separate and private from the public access. So the question that the state then has raised is whether or not, I assume this is the essential uh, argument, is whether or not Mr. Avery himself has standing. It's conceded that he had standing in his house or trailer and that he has standing in his garage, but the contest that he had standing anywhere else and presumably that indicates the location where the RAV4 was found, a so-called burn pit, burn barrel, located outside his residence and garage. The state uh, has had filed a brief or a memo to the courts the day before this motion hearing started yesterday, and I did not have time to, a chance to file a written response. I apologize for that, but it was not received until very the very day before this. I did have a chance to review some of their cases and some of my own, and I have some sites, some references, and legal authority which I think run counter to their arguments. First of all, the case of Rockus v. Illinois, which is at 439 U.S. at page 139, I believe it is, makes clear that the Fourth Amendment, a claim, a Fourth Amendment claim does not depend on property right. It is a personal right. It's a right and expectation of privacy in the invaded place. Fourth Amendment does not protect property. It protects people from unreasonable searches and seizures. No single factor is determinative on the question of standing. That's also from Ruckus at 152. 
and State versus Whitrock, which I believe is also a site cited by the state at 161 WIS 2D at page 974, says that the court must take totality of the circumstances approaching approach when determining the question of standing. It is true, defendant does not have the burden of establishing, however, just by just by a preponderance of the evidence that he had a reasonable expectation of privacy in the the things searched. But Whitrock and Arizona versus Hicks, which is the site four eighty US three two one in nineteen eighty seven, make clear that a defendant does not need to show an ownership interest in a place or thing to be seized, and that thing, in fact, seized need not even be his own property. In both Whitrock and Hicks, I believe stolen property was involved, and in Hicks, the court found that there was a reasonable expectation of privacy even in the stolen stereo equipment that was found inside of his individual house. And in that case, the police, in order to determine whether or not an item was stolen, he was obviously not stolen when they went in, went in there, but they moved pieces around and they looked at serial numbers and they recorded those. And they went back later and determined that the property appeared to have been stolen or reported stolen. And on that basis, they went back with a warrant. And the court stated, no, no, you can't do that. That was improper. That's a, that's a, all, and that's akin to Detective Remaker going onto this property using a flashlight in order to read a, the VIN number on, that, on this vehicle. The case law also shows that people have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a variety of areas, a number of different uh, settings. The Tricori, T-R-E-C, R O C I case. I think it's misspelled in the state's brief, but that's the site for that is 246 WIS 2D 261. It's a courts of appeals case from not, I'm sorry, from 2001. That case actually does a fairly good job of summarizing what some of the factors are and what some of the various areas of where standing has been found even when someone doesn't own property. And I point out that the state used Mr. Earl Avery to try and establish that Stephen Avery did not have ownership interest or a portion of that property. But that really is irrelevant on the question of standing here. The numerous cases uh, say you don't have to own property to have a reasonable expectation of privacy in it. I will get into that a little bit more that in a minute. Even in a workplace, employees have a reasonable expectation of privacy. O'Connor versus, versus Ortega, 480 U.S. 709 at 17 in 1981, I believe, or 87. Overnight guests in a house have an expectation of privacy. State versus Whitrock, again, even commercial areas and, and garbage. The steps are taken to exclude the public, can't have, or areas that one can have an expectation, a reasonable expectation of privacy in. The Tricorsi case at page 282 sort of list gives a helpful list of factors to consider in determining whether someone has standing in a particular place. And it's not necessary that all of them be met, but they are considered in part as part of the totality of the circumstances. The first is whether the person had a proprietary interest in the premises. And here, clearly, he had a proprietary interest in the house and the garage. He did not have, he was not aware, not an owner of the Avery Salvage business, but, on the other hand, he worked there. It's a family business. He lived on the property. Earl talked about how he did. Stephen Avery did all the things that Earl did, including dismantling vehicles, driving out to pick up junk, bringing them back and forth. And so the fact that it's a family business, I think, makes a factor in somewhat less critical second factor is whether the person was legitimately on the premises that are searched. Clearly, Mr. Avery lived on, on the Avery compound, so to speak, or right next to it, and he worked on the compound every day. So he clearly was legitimately there. Whether the person had a complete dominion and control and the right to exclude others, perhaps he didn't have as much of a complete dominion as he would an owner, but nevertheless, he worked there. He lived there. He worked the car crusher right there in the area 
this was found. He had full access to all the property as a family member and as, and a person as a person who worked in the family business. The next factor is whether the person took precautions customarily taken by those seeking privacy. I have covered that already, but I think in the berms, the fences, it's clear that the property itself does have attributes to indicate that there is a reasonable expectation of privacy in that property. Whether the person had put the property into some private use, clearly they did. There's a business in the front. There's public office in the upper right or northeast corner of the 40-acre parcel, but the rest of it is private. There's private residences both to the north edge and down the eastern edge where Chuck Avery lives, and all the land belonged to the family. And finally, well, the claim of privacy is consistent with historical notions of privacy. This is a fluid concept because that's probably changed over time, but here people knew, know that if you enter someone's private property, you must receive permission to do so. Even the volunteers who testified, Pamela Stern, recognized that she had to get permission from Earl Avery before she could go into the area of, of the yard just to do a search. So I think that that's a factor that clearly indicates there's a historical and reasonable expectation of privacy in that area. Then finally, there's a question of the, well, let me just, before I turn to the burn barrel and pit area, if I, if I make the first hurdle, if we pass the first hurdle and the court finds that there was an ins insufficient, is, is sufficiently reckless or intentional misstatements or falsehoods in the affidavit and that therefore they are stricken, then the court, I think, sequentially next has to look at the question of whether or not Detective Remaker, therefore, was in a position where he was not lawfully permitted to take make the ob observations. The rest of the observations that are included in paragraph five, and if so, there is no reasonable, there is no probable cause for the warrant. The entire warrant is void, and the search is void, at least as as to that warrant. Later warrants were obtained, and we have to deal with with those uh, issues later. But as to this warrant they would be void. And that would also answer the question as to any evidence found outside Mr. Avery's residence, such as the burn pit or the burn barrel or whatever. We wouldn't even have to get in the question of standing because if the warrant is void, it's void. But as to the question of standing, it's not clear to me just what position the state is taking on this. If the testimony was and exhibits show that the burn barrel was right outside of the, in front of the residence, front area of the trailer and the burn pit was behind the detached garage. So I don't know how they are going to argue they had a privacy and interest in the house and the garage, but not to those areas that are close by. If that's their position, then they will have to make it, but I don't see it. It's a bit of a different argument, uh, I think, when we get into the far corner of the property where the vehicle is made. But as to those other areas, I don't see any legitimate argument. So, as though, uh, so for those reasons, I think we have established a reasonable expectation of privacy by preponderance of the evidence. I think we have established it, that there were uh, material, intentional, or reckless disregard for the truth in the affidavit. And I think we have established as well that those improper, improper falsehoods uh, or illegally obtained portions of, stri of stricken from this warrant that there is no probable cause left in the warrant. So the search and any searches based on the November 5th warrant would have to be voided and any evidence suppressed. Thank you. The court. Mr. Fallon? Attorney Fallon. Thank you, Judge. Well, the defense argument is stunning for the facts which admitted during the presentation of their argument. So in an, in an effort, let's first of all start with a couple of general principles, then we'll go through the evidence which I understand was presented during the last day and a half. Counsel is correct. It is the totality of the circumstances analysis with respect to determination of whether or not Mr. Avery has a reasonable expectation of privacy in the area searched and in the items seized. It, if there is no reasonable expectation of privacy in the area searched and the items seized, there is, as it pertains to Mr. Avery, no Fourth Amendment event there is no search. 
there is no basis for a hearing and there is no basis to request suppression. Now, first and foremost, the counsel is correct and does cite Rockus versus Illinois, in which case that we clearly cite in our brief. It's a critical case and counsel is quite right. In fact, it's one of the few things that I do agree with that the Fourth Amendment reasonable expectation of privacy is not conditioned upon the existence of a property right. We agree, quite frankly, that supports the state's argument that there is no standing, no reasonable expectation of privacy. In determination of whether there is a reasonable expectation of privacy, the burden is on the defense to establish by a preponderance of the evidence whether it's more likely than not, whether it's someone's over 50%, is it likely that, if, that this person has two things, whether the individual has an exhibited an actual subjective expectation of privacy in the area inspected or searched and in the item seized. The second part of the question is, is the expectation, is it one that society is willing to recognize as reasonable, as a reasonable expectation of privacy under the circumstances? There has been no evidence of an actual subjective expectation of privacy produced by Mr. Avery. We have references to the berms and we have references to the fence line. We have no reference to the fact that those berms were created uh, with that intent and that it's subjective expectation. We have no evidence that there was actually a fence where it goes along that fence line. We have no evidence that Mr. Avery took any, any reasonable steps to secure the salvage yard the location of where Teresa Hallbach's vehicle was found, the vehicle in which her license plate was found, the burn barrel, which I might add and point out to the court, exhibit number 18, is located up there. Up here, Mr. Avery's residence is here. We have a burn pit, which is behind a garage, and I will get to that in a minute. There has been no demonstration of an actual subjective expectation of privacy that has been provided to this court. All we have is a berm line, a fence line. We have a rather isolated geographical piece of property. That alone is insufficient to justify or a conclusion, first of all, that there's an actual subjective expectation of privacy. And more importantly, or equally important, I should say, there's been nothing here that demonstrates that society is prepared to accept that Stephen Avery has a reasonable expectation of privacy and location of the Toyota RAV4 vehicle found at the bottom of exhibit number 18. More importantly, there's been no evidence whatsoever that suggests he has a reasonable expectation of privacy about anything in that vehicle. And while he might he may not have a property right, we agree he has he has no property right with respect to her vehicle. He has no property right with respect to the blood found in the vehicle, unless of course it's his blood. But then again, we don't have any testimony saying that. We don't have any evidence of the fact introduced at this hearing of those facts justifying a reasonable expectation of privacy here. He did, he did not drive that vehicle. He did not own that vehicle. And as far as we know, the only time he touched that vehicle was sometime during the week of October 31st. With respect to the contents of the burn barrel, the location of the burn barrel, or where's the reasonable expectation of privacy? Anyone could would drive up and down the uh, upper road here, stop and look in that burn barrel. Burn barrel, anything in a burn barrel is discarded and abandoned property. This is it, it's the quintessential act of abandoned property. Burn stuff is in there. What reasonable expectation of privacy? Actual. First of all, what subjective actual expectation of privacy did that man have in the contents of his of this burn barrel? What expectation of privacy did he have? in the remains of the of camera, in the remains of the cell phone, in the remains of the other items collected there. It's not only an expectation of privacy in, in the place, but also in the things. There's been no evidence, no argument, nothing whatsoever. The burn pit located behind the garage, what special, what evidence do we have there uh, or any special expectation of privacy there? Yes, okay, it's located behind the, the barn. Great, do we have any demonstration? Do we have any evidence that there was an actual subjective expectation of privacy created by Stephen Avery in the burn pit? There's no evidence on the record, not one iota, 
that he did anything special to secrete that area to shield it from anywhere else other than it's a geographical location and quite frankly that's not enough more to the point what what reasonable or actual subjective expectation of privacy does he have in the contents of the fit what subjective actual expectation of privacy does he have in the remains of Teresa Halbach I certainly didn't hear any evidence suggesting that he had such an expectation of privacy relative to the contents of the burn pit either now let's further address some of the case laws cited by the defense it's been a while since I read Arizona X Arizona verse 6 but it seems to, uh, to me the principle that counsel cites in that is that individuals can't have an expectation of privacy in stolen items that's true but the search of in Hicks occurred in the uh, house of Mr. Hicks if I remember and it's been some time so there's no there is an expectation in place which then of course provided an additional expectation of privacy in the in the items within the place well that's far different from the set of facts than we have here then they cite O'Connor versus Ortega. Ownership is not, let's see, Ortega, if memory serves me, was a case involving a search of an individual at his place of employment. As a matter of fact, O'Connor versus Ortega, I believe, was an actual search of the person's private office. Again, that's an entirely different set of circumstances that we have in this particular case. Again, they cite, Whit they cite the Whitrock case, which I also cite for the principal the general principle in my brief for another point certainly guests can have an expectation of privacy in someone else's home we certainly not contesting that but then again it's not a place that searched it's how reasonable is their expectations and it's not a carte blanche just because you have a guest they always forever have a reasonable expectation of privacy in for instance your home there are other factors that courts look at but it's not uncommon I don't see how that case has any uh, any particular relevance or the principles therein have any application to this case because the facts are so unique and so different. Next, it's pretty much conceded in their argument and the testimony that by and large vast area uh, the vast area contained in exhibit number 18 here is attributed to the auto salvage yard. Well, the last time I looked, an auto salvage yard was a commercial enterprise of business. And while one may have, and I use the word one because I will come back to that, one may have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a commercial property, but it is less than a reasonable expectation of privacy one would have in a private dwelling. The best case for that is New York versus Burger, B-U-R-G-E-R, 482 U.S. dot 691, page 700 in 1987. And if memory serves, Berger, I think, involved a search to an auto salvage yard. Now, with respect to the challenge here, we have no reasonable, no actual subjective expectation of privacy, which has been established in the defense presentation of evidence. In this particular case, not only is there no actual subjective expectation of privacy in the areas that we have just talked about, there's no one that in society is willing to, or prepared to accept as reasonable under the circumstances of this case. Again, this is a commercial piece of property by and large. It is a property which is held open to the public. It's the state's position that Mr. Avery doesn't have a, have a basis to challenge the search warrant except and only limited to the search of his residence and the garage. Any property located elsewhere, he did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in. Particularly in addition, in additional, the argument is with respect to the burn area and the burn pits. You have abandoned property. You have abandoned property. You have burn property, and more importantly, relative to the expectation of privacy, there is no evidence, there is no testimony, that there were any steps taken by Mr. Aries. Uh, Inventing an actual subjective expectation of privacy other than their mere location and quite frankly in a near curtilage to borrow an old common law term is not enough all right moving on to the challenge of the Franks motion the, the state's primary argument 
and I'm going to begin with the procedural argument and I will reach the merits. The procedural argument is first and foremost the defendant's pleading. Its motion uh, affidavit supporting documentation we believe was insufficient to testify to justify the courts taking the evidentiary testimony in the first place. First, there must be a substantial preliminary showing that there was a false statement, knowingly and intentionally, or with reckless disregard for the truth, was included in the warrant and affidavit, and that their statement was, is necessary to the finding of probable cause. We agree. Franks v. Delaware is the, essential, is the seminal case in this matter. It has been adopted and its reasoning applied in a couple of Wisconsin cases, most notably State v. Anderson. To make a substantial preliminary showing that there must be allegations uh, of deliberate falsehood and reckless disregard, and those allegations may be, must be accompanied by an offer of proof. When you look at the motion and the supporting documentation uh, of the defense, they raise conclusion, conclusionary allegations uh, that there were certain false statements made, but they don't really show or demonstrate that there were uh, any, any, in the in, any in the pleadings any intent on the part of the affiant, in this case, Investigator Wigert, to deliberately mislead and lie to the court in an effort to obtain the warrant. Their pleading is totally and completely deficient. It is uh, conclusionarily only, and I will rely on the argument raised in my written brief on that particular point. Again, a presumption of validity attends to the affidavit. In this case, their pleading fails to establish that the key argument was false or made with reckless disregard for the truth. Defense, defense avenges its an argument primarily on two concepts, whether or not there were really volunteers and this, the manner in which the vehicle identification number commonly referred to, uh, to the VIN was obtained. So let's take those one at a time. In their pleadings, they allege that they weren't really volunteers. I believe I specifically point pages, I think it's 7 or 8, or 8 and 9, where they raise the specter that there was only a grand scheme to employ volunteers to secretly invade the Avery compound and conduct a search. At best, the pleading suggests that they might do something like that, at best. In other words, might use the volunteer searches to help assist in the search. This discussion, while there was meeting, there was a meeting, that we were all going to meet at the Manitowoc, Manitowoc Sheriff's Department, that all, at best, signifies an intent to have something happen in the future. It doesn't exist. It doesn't establish the existence of any kind of working relationship or to take the legal, fra uh, legal phrase now, an agency -relate relationship or a joint venture relationship with law enforcement at the time of Pamela Stern's entry into that property. At best, it's, it suggests maybe at some point we will utilize these searchers to assist us in the search. As it turned out, we know from Mr. Hillegas that several days later he did assist in that capacity. But the pleadings don't tell tell us such tell us that such, or suggest that such an agency existed at the time of entry. There's there's no evidence to suggest that Pamela Sturm in the affidavit was working, or at the behest for law enforcement. There's no evidence anywhere in the affidavit that suggests that such an agency relationship existed or was established prior to gaining entry on the morning of November 5th. So their pleading is deficient. Secondly, with respect to the VIN number, they say that there was a, a lie regarding the whole concept of matching, primarily bringing its argument on whether uh, the Pamela F. Stern found all the VIN characters upon her examination of the vehicle. Well, regardless of whether she did or she didn't, it is irrelevant. Detective Remaker did have the opportunity to examine the vehicle, did have the opportunity to find all 17 characters, and, and that was hours before the warrant and affidavit was prepared and submitted to a judicial officer for review and signature. And again, with respect to the pleadings, we'll come back on the technical argument and make this point. I think if you were to remove the discussion of the VIN number entirely from paragraph 5, the affidavit was prepared by Investigator Wigert states probable cause easily. We know at the time of the affidavit, and the court has the affidavit, I believe it's marked as Exhibit 15, if memory serves me. Yes, Exhibit 15. 
We know that in paragraph 2 of this particular case, that a missing person complaint was filed with the Calumet County Sheriff's Department by Karen Halbach. We know that her daughter had not been seen or heard from since Monday, October 31, 2005, and that it was unusual for her not to have contact with her family, friends, or work people. We know further from that paragraph that she was driving a 1999 Toyota RAV4 dark blue in color. We also know that on November 4th, we have Mr. Avery informing investigators, I believe Investigator Remaker, that Teresa Halbach was in fact on his property. He did see her on October 31st, 2005, uh, that she was there to take photog photographs of the vehicle he was selling. We also know that he was out, out of concern regarding the obtaining of the VIN number that Pamela Stern found the Toyota RAV4 on the property on November 5th. That's less than five days, a few hours less than five days after she was last seen on the property. The interesting thing about the Toyota RAV4, as she described it, the, the affidavit says it was dark blue in color. She finds the RAV4, the RAV4 she, that she finds her attention is drawn to. It is not unfair, an unfair inference to draw that it has some similar appearance to, uh, to the RAV4 of Teresa Halbach. But what really makes this case rather interesting is the fact that of all the vehicles that were, that were there, we have a RAV4 which is secreted by brush and other automobile parts less than, again, less than five days after she was last seen, known to be driving that vehicle. That in of itself is probable cause to justify a search warrant, the issuance of a search warrant in this particular case. Now, additionally, let's assume for the sake of argument that we don't have to assume, but we will for the purpose of procedural argument. That Pamela Sturm was only able to read four of the characters, not ten. But let's just say it was just four. Let's just say that it was at the last four, three, zero, four, four. What are the odds, what are the probabilities that is, in fact, Teresa Halbach's vehicle, when you consider all these facts, uh, easily meets probable cause at ten digits? Does that make it closer? Ten digits were at were preponderance of the were preponderance of the evidence. All right, now to the merits of the argument and the testimony that was delivered. The testimony establishes, I think, critical testimony was provided by Pamela Sturm and Ralph Nilligus. With respect to Pamela Sturm, she testified that she had no contact whatsoever with any member of law enforcement regarding the decision to participate in the volunteer search program, and more importantly, the decision to go to the Avery property and look for Teresa Halbach's vehicle. As she indicated, and she, and she was confirmed by Ron Hilligus, it was her idea. No one, told, no one told her anything. No one suggested anything. In fact, she hadn't even been given instructions by Mr. Hilligus as to what to do and how to do it. He gave her a copy of the General's map of the area, and she and her daughter, Nicole, went on their way uh, and took the initiative and decided they would go there. Because at least she knew in her mind from the media newscast, the last place Teresa Halbach was seen that anyone knew at the time was the Avery property. It was her decision to go there, without any association with law enforcement whatsoever. That was confirmed by Ryan Hilligus. The volunteer, this entire volunteer search effort, especially in those early days, that being Thursday night, Friday, when the poster uh, posters were picked up, Friday morning, when the posters and information were distributed, was entirely his workings, uh, along with his friends and Teresa Halbach's roommate, Scott Blodorn. They were in charge of the volunteer efforts. There's no testimony they took in any organization uh, any direction, any control, any supervision, or any advice, for that matter, from any, from law enforcement, uh, other than perhaps, and uh, the record is thin on this, if you find something, call us, Here's, here are the phone numbers. Hardly any, uh, hardly evidence indicating or establishing the existence of an agency relationship or a joint venture relationship. In fact, as I recall the testimony of Ron Hilligus, it wasn't until after later on Friday that they decided that uh, they would have a meeting at the residence of Teresa Halbach and Scott Blodorn's uh, the next morning and perhaps to do some searches. 
And when questioned about the uh, scope or uh, purpose or focus of these searches, he indicated that they were searching the roads, the ditch lines, the general fields in the area from Manitowoc to Meshkot, uh, to the area where the, the apartment where uh, Teresa Halbach lived. Their assumption was, in fact, that she had perhaps had some uh, automobile accident. Uh, that was their focus. They weren't looking to search private premises or private property per se, other than something that might be associated with an open field. Um, that was the focus. There was no law enforcement involvement in that, and as indicated, Pamela Sturm and her daughter, Nicole, show up a good hour after everyone else had been dispatched. Again, she uh, the, the decision to go there was entirely theirs. The tape played by counsel is rather interesting, but there's a couple of ways to look at that. Uh, but more importantly, it supports the argument made relative to the procedural point, and that is, at least, it signifies that, well, we're going to have searchers, maybe we can use those searchers to do something later. Uh, we want to go back, we want to get to a re-interview of Mr. Avery, we want to you know, get a re-interview re of Mr. Zipperer, and we're going to ask for uh, consent. We can get the, get the searchers to help us with the search. Again, doesn't signify any agency existed, doesn't signify any joint venture existed at that time. At best, it signals that perhaps one would occur in the future. It certainly doesn't suggest, and it doesn't even come close to suggesting uh, that there is an error, a lie, or an omission uh, relative to just who these searches uh, were and what they're up to. Now, with respect to that, I would like to direct the court to the case of State versus Anderson as an example of what would constitute an error or a lie or a mission. Anderson was a case that came out of Kenosha County regarding the execution of a warrant uh, for narcotics at a particular residence there. In that case, the defense challenged the search warrant on the Frank's motion, alleging that there were two lies uh, or reckless disregard for the truth that occurred in the presentation of the affidavit. One was a statement by the undercover or by the officer, the affiant, who said, well, I have reason to believe that uh, that the informant we use here is reliable because we made, we made two prior purchases with that individual, and they demonstrated their reliability. The pinch challenged that uh, as a reckless statement, insufficient to justify credibility, reliance by the court on that. Secondly, they challenged the statements when the undercover officer said, well, I saw we, I saw the informant go to and from the residence of the defendant, return, and uh, come from the residence uh, of the defendant. It turns out that actually the investigator did lose sight of the informant for a moment or two, and never actually saw them enter the house or exit the house. But it was a matter of the of moments. The court likewise determined, under those types of facts, uh, that those were not lies, that they were not reckless disregard for the truth. They were reasonable and inferences drawn from the circumstances which were presented in court. And again, under those circumstances, and taking an analogy, what's occurred here, there is no unfair, unreasonable inference drawn from the contents of this affidavit. And if those statements under those circumstances were found to be supportive of the issuance of the warrant in that particular case, then certainly anything that occurred in the affidavit here meet legal sufficiency. The other thing which the Anderson case notes, and I would again point out in the footnote and footnote seven of Anderson, the court, what's the citation? Attorney Fallon. Yes, one thirty eight WIS dot two D page four fifty one, specifically page four sixty four. The Anderson site is in my brief. Footnote seven the court noted that they were, quote, we are unconvinced that a hearing was, was provided, provincially granted in that case. The Anderson case is, is also significant for another reason, which was discounted by the defense, and so we take issue with that. And that is, the defense says uh, that what information was contained in Investigator Wigert's mind, in other words, what information he had available to him at the time, he applied for the warrant, which may or may not have found its way into the affidavit, was irrelevant. Well, quite frankly, 
nothing could be further from the truth because as Ruckus and Illinois, versus Illinois, as Franks versus Delaware, and as State versus Anderson tells us specifically, I should say Franks versus the Delaware, not Ruckus, as Frank the Delaware, and the Anderson case tells us, it says because the defendant must show either intent or reckless disregard of Frank's hearing by necessity focuses on the state of mind of the affiant. So what investigator Wiegert knew and what and when he knew it was important. Uh, that was at the basis of, uh, for the testimony. He knew that they had found a Toyota RAV4. He knew from the telephone conversations that it was a late model. In fact, the court uh, can consult Exhibit 16 in regard to that. As a matter of fact, Exhibit number 6, I'm sorry, Exhibit 16 was the recording. So either one, Exhibit 16, but Exhibit 17 is the written transcription. Looking at page 62, question uh, by Detective Wiegert. Question, does it look like a, a newer one? Caller, yes, yeah, it's a, it's the 99 to 2000. Wiegert, is there any collar? It's more of a bluish green, though. That's why we don't want to put, you know. Question, is there any license plates on it? Collar, no plates on it, but it's a little covered up. It's weird. It's covered up. There's also much discussion as to whether it was dark blue, blue, bluish green, and the court can consult the transcript on the tape, but it says it's more blue than green. During the course of that trip from the Calumet County to Manitowoc to the property itself, Investigator Wigert knew that there was a sticker, dealer sticker on Teresa's vehicle, and then confirmed with, with uh, Miss Sturm that the vehicle she found likewise had a sticker. Uh, they knew some of the VIN numbers. Upon arrival, they got the rest of the VIN numbers. All that information goes to the state of mind. So when officers officers uses the word matching, that's what's in his mind. And matching, by the way, doesn't have to be a hyper technical term, as counsel would like it to suggest it is. And perhaps in the purposes of DNA analysis, matching means hyper technical. Dot your eyes, cross your T's, perfect fit. But in everyday parlance, matching means matching. It looks like it is. It is. It's similar to etc. Again, that becomes relevant because the whole purpose of the Fourth Amendment search and seizure law, the whole determination of probable cause, is that it's, it's not a hyper-technical determination. It's based on reason. It's based on common sense. It's based on inferences. It's based on reasonable possibilities and probabilities that an item, an item looked for will be found in the place searched. Now, did you want to respond to some concerns? Because, yes, first and foremost, Pamela, uh, Pamela Sturm did have consent. I don't think that's questioned. She had consent to enter and uh, enter the property. She told us so. And Mr. O. Avery likewise confirmed that he allowed her in. As a matter of fact, his words when questioned about that were to the effect, well, he was concerned. He wanted to, He wanted to help out. He wanted to do what he could, and when I, when I asked, well, if it was your sister, you would want uh, somebody willing to help out and let you take a look around, and I believe his answer was uh, yes. So there's no question that Pamela Stern rightfully had a way to get on there. Again, it's a commercial property. Again, this occurred in the morning when the property, the salvage yard, where the vehicle was located, was in business. It was during business hours, 8 to noon. Uh, they were there at 11. So as the property held open to the public, uh, there were a number of, there are other members of the public milling about through the yard. In fact, the phone call, Exhibit 16 and 17, which the court is, again, free to pursue, indicates that there was observations of other individuals floating around at the time the vehicle was found. In fact, Miss Stern was somewhat concerned because she didn't know who they were or what they were up to and she had a pretty good feeling that she had found the vehicle. Otherwise, I don't think uh, she would have been all that concerned. But not knowing who was there, what's going on, I think the fact that her heightened sensitivity is further evidence. Also a fact in the mind of Investigator Wigert and Sheriff Poggle 
that there was something to the finding of that vehicle, uh, that it was a vehicle everyone was looking for. Next, the defense would have us to believe that there is no basis for law enforcement to even be uh, to even come in there. Well, excuse me, but you have a situation where you have the vehicle of a missing person found in the corner of a business piece of property. Law enforcement had every right to go in there and assist in one securing the vehicle. You have exigent circumstances here. It's interest interesting to note that, as was pointed out in the testimony, the ve vehicle reason is reasonably close to the car crusher. The vehicle is also secreted from view. It is a vehicle, as Mr. Avery told us, he didn't even know was there two or three days earlier. So all these factors come into question as to the reasonableness, uh, and that's the linchpin of the Fourth Amendment analysis the reasonableness of the law enforcement behavior upon the arrival at the scene. They went there, they secured the vehicle, they took care of the safety of Pamela Sturman and her daughter, Nicole. Now, even in, if the defense wanted to make the argument, I saw, I heard inklings of it, that there were somehow some kind of trespass here by law enforcement. Well, the, the reality is that doesn't matter. Uh, we, don't believe, we don't believe there was. But even if the court were somewhat concerned, I would ask the court to direct and perhaps consider the case of the United States versus Oliver, Supreme Court case at 466 U.S. 170. Oliver is not particularly noteworthy for the court's analysis except for the respect to one point, and, and that deals with the law of trespass and its possible application to the Fourth Amendment determination. The law of trespass, this is page 183, Law of trespass, however, forbids intrusion upon the land the Fourth Amendment would not prescribe. For trespass law extends to instances where exercise of the right to exclude vindicates no legitimate privacy interest. And then they go on the go on to say there is a footnote which I will get to in a in a minute. They go on to say less in the case of open fields, the general rights of property protected by common law trespass have little to do with relevance to the applicability of the Fourth Amendment. Well, by analogy, we're in a salvage yard here, uh, and whose expectation of privacy are we concerned with, Earl and Charles Avery, or is it with Stephen Avery? With respect to trespass, the court went on a footnote, uh, the law of trespass recognizes the interest and possession and control of one's property, and for, the, for that reason permits exclusion of unwanted intruders. But it does not allow the right to exclude conferred by trespass law embodies a privacy interest also protected by the Fourth Amendment. To the contrary, the common law of trespass further furthers a range of interests that have nothing to do with privacy that would not be served by applying the strictures of trespass law to public officers. And the footnote goes on. In examining the totality of circumstances here, uh, taking all of the evidence that the court has taken in, over the course of the last day and a half, there is no basis whatsoever under the Fourth Amendment law to suppress any of the evidence. One, there is no standing by Mr. Avery to challenge any of the searches other than the search of his trailer uh, his, and his residence, although he attempts to do so, and he attempts to do so on the basis of the Franks challenge. Again, there is no basis to hold a hearing, and clearly based on the testimony which is established by all the witnesses here, there was certainly a probable cause to justify the search warrant and conduct the search that law enforcement conducted. Uh, there is no material admission or material lie affecting the establishment of probable cause in this particular case. As a result, this court is duty-bound to deny the request, and we ask the court to do so. Thank you. The Court. Mr. Buting, brief rebuttal. Attorney Buting. Yes, Judge. I will try to be brief because I know it's getting late here. The a couple of things are not a lot of things are not clear about what the position the state uh, is really taking here. It seems to me it seems to say that because Mr. Avery has no personal privacy interest in, for instance, the remains of Teresa, he can't have any standing. That's totally irrelevant. The courts have made it clear that they would also also be true to stolen property, as in Hicks. One has no expectation uh, no or no personal interest in that stolen property. You shouldn't even have it in your house, 
but the court said that's not the issue. Ownership is really irrelevant when it comes to standing. So, and that applies also to, uh, he said it a couple of times. I think he also mentioned it when he was talking about the vehicle. He didn't drive it. He didn't, uh, he didn't own it, etc., etc. Again, that doesn't matter. The issue is, is there is, is an expectation of privacy. And frankly, if one, one factor that he ignored is in determining whether someone has an expectation of privacy, if state is going to argue that there was some effort to conceal it, uh, that would be seem to be even more indi indicate that there was an ex expectation of privacy if it was not put out in the open. The reference uh, to the burn barrel somehow being, the burn pit somehow being, like abandoned and somehow the expect, uh, no expectation of privacy, absolutely, I totally disagree with. First of all, it's not like, a, uh, like garbage. Even garbage you have an expectation of privacy in until as long as it's by your curtilage until it is picked up as people often retrieve things from the garbage. This is entirely different. When you burn, uh, when you burn a burn barrel, expectation it's not being picked up. It's not ever going to be some uh, someone else. The contents of the burn barrel are, it's going to be entirely burned up. That's the point of it. Moreover, the location of it, as we have seen numerous times through these descriptions, it's probably a good half mile. You have to uh, get off the highway and drive a half mile down to the driveway, goes over by Mr. Avery, and then back over his proper, property, going all the way down around this big parcel of Attorney Fallon. I'm going to object. I don't believe there's any evidence uh, that's a half mile ride from one point to the other. I don't recall any evidence being introduced. Attorney Buting. Well, whether it's exactly a half mile, it's clearly a long way off the highway. Would Mr. Suppose uh, this analogy, uh, uh, would Mr. Powell say that if you have a clothesline hanging over an area with a burn pile where the burn pit is we, uh, with your clothes on it, that any any individual from the public or law enforcement uh, could drive down the highway 147, turn right on Avery Road, then drive around the corner, take a left, go all the way over to Steve Nevy's residence, park, get out, walk around the back of it, and start going through your clothes? Of course not. The, clo the location of, of it is that obviously not open to the public, and there's clearly an expectation of privacy. By the same token, would he expect that somebody would be allowed to drive off the highway of 147 down the road, turn left, go all the way down the driveway, and start sticking their nose in the burn barrel? No, I don't think so. I think the location clearly indicates an expectation of privacy. And it's not like garbage, because no, there's no expectation it's going to be picked up by anybody. The reference, the reference to commercial business, as I want to mention just for one second, O'Connor versus Ortega, I think, uh, I think, uh, did deal with a, a private office, and it was in a hospital, I think. But the comparison of this, what I cited for it is to point out was even there's even an expectation of privacy in a commercial setting, not just a private meeting, or private setting. But this is not strictly that you would uh, classify as an employment, uh, or an employee or employer type of case, because this is a family-run business. It's not like Mr. Avery is just an employee of GE or something who has his own private office and the expectation is in there, but that everything else in the big plant is not. Uh, this is different. This is a small family-run business where he is not just an employee. He's a member of the family working there and living there. And there is one other case that I would uh, like to set for the court on that point, and that's State versus Schwegler, S C H W. E G L A R 170 W I S dot 2D 487 1992 case, which was a horse barn. Again, it was a commercial business, but where the horse barn and there was an inspection done, that the court ultimately found the owner of the business, even though it was a commercial business, had an expectation of privacy, and that in that barn. And the warrantless inspection was unlawful. One last point on the question of proximity, and used to be called curtilage and that sort of thing. Again, like I call all Fourth Amendment law, 
It was a very fact intensive. The courts recognized the difference between a very large property and a small one. In State versus Martwick, M A R M A R T W I C K, that's 231 WIS.2D, page 801. I don't have the year. I don't think, but it's at page 819. The court rules on a smaller property, such as Markwick's property, the curtilage may very well be ex- ex- may very well extend for less distance than on a large prop- larger property, where the co- owner has more room to conduct his or her quite intimate activities of life, citing a U.S. Supreme Court case. And uh, they also, in this case, they found that it wasn't. But they also note in State v. O'Brien, which is at 223-WIS. 2D uh, 303 at page 316, a 19, uh, 1999 Wisconsin Supreme Court case. The Supreme Court found that a truck parked approximately 200 feet from the farmhouse was nonetheless within the curtilage. So when one is talking about a large open farm type or a parcel like we have here, uh, the whole concept of curtilage is different than if you're talking about a little uh, city house. Now, this is the question of probable cause and whether the state argues that even if you take, uh, you strike a certain part from paragraph 5 of the affidavit, there's still sufficient probable cause. And one of the points that he made is, he argues, well, the rest of the affidavit says she's been missing since October 31st. They spoke to Mr. Avery. He conceded that he did see her on October 31st. And that then Sturm, the volunteer searcher, Citizen Searcher found a Toyota a RAV4 on the property, and as if that alone, I think he says, would, would be probable cause. But, and maybe in some settings it would be, you know, if this were a farm with no other vehicles, and you happen to have, or maybe just one or two vehicles, and you happen to find a Toyota RAV4, well, perhaps that's uh, probable cause, probably would be. This is an auto, auto junkyard. There's 4,000 cars there. Uh, the, so the mere existence of a Toyota RAV4 would not be unusual. It would not be so si- significant in that of itself, absent of any uh, any other descriptions that match, uh, that there would be a probable cause. Now, I would concede, so there is no, we don't want to waste any more time on this, that in our pleadings, we believe that the evidence would indicate that there was an agency type of relationship between these searchers, uh, these citizens, and police and that they were conducting using them as an in-around. And I will concede that the way that the evidence came out on this record, we haven't established that. Uh, Pamela Sturm and Ryan Hillegas, whether truthful or not, uh, clearly for the, uh, the record from them is that they did not have any contact with law enforcement. They weren't organized, encouraged, or whatever. My point is playing that segment on, uh, or the brief phone conversation today of Investigator Wigert was not to try and show that his reference to volunteer proves that he was using them for that, but it goes to his credibility on the other matters that he's uh, testified to, because he swore an oath that he did not uh, say anything to Remaker on the phone call about using or intending to use volunteers uh, to search the Avery property. Attorney Fallon, I'm going to object. That's a mischaracterization of his testimony. Attorney Buting, obviously it's the court. His testimony will speak for itself. I will take a look at the uh, transcript. Attorney Beauty. Okay, so yes, but conceding that, that one part of the paragraph 5, we have not established our burden on, says nothing about the rest of it, though granted, okay, so they're volunteer searchers according to this record. But Wiegert also says that the volunteer searchers said they had a, had a matching, a vehicle matching the description. And we know that's not true. The reference in Franks and Anderson that the state makes to the state of mind uh, of the affiant being important, he totally misunderstands or he's taking it out of context. What the court is talking about is, sure, the state of mind of the affiant is important because it's important as to the intent of the recklessness element of the test. It's It's not relevant what the affiant has in his mind that it doesn't present uh, to the court. Otherwise, why would we have the search warrants in the first place? If all all that was needed was the officer in his own mind 
is convinced that he's got enough evidence, but he feels like he doesn't have even have to tell the court. That's preposterous. That's uh, that's turning on turning on its end the whole process of requiring an independent evaluation by a magistrate, not allowing officers themselves to accumulate facts uh, or beliefs to come to some conclusion on their own. Those facts and beliefs that need to be presented to the court. It's not enough that he, in his own mind, thought, oh, well, this is enough for a match. He should tell the court what it is that makes him think that, and he didn't do that. Just two quick other points. One, yes, this is a property open for business, and yes, there are other people wandering around there at the time, but all of them, but all of them had permission. It's clear. Uh, that's the custom and practice that was people don't go into that salvage yard into the pit and start looking at cars without, that is customers, without permission from the owner first. And that's what Pamela Sturm did, and that's not what uh, Detective Rimmaker did. It's not a question of trying to apply a trespass law, specifically, which is in the Oliver case. It's a question of under of under the Fourth Amendment whether Detective Rimmaker had a lawful purpose in being there, and he was observing that law, what he saw, even if there is an, in some exigent circumstance to allow him to come into the property and to, and to quote secure the vehicle. He did not. He did much more than that, and that's to the, and that's the point. He did just come down here, secure the vehicle, talk to the Sturms, then go get a warrant, which is what he should have done. He did more. He searched the vehicle because he went up to it with his flashlight, and he looked in, and he used illumination to allow him uh, to see other, other evidence related to the car, uh, particularly the vent. That's what happened. It's analogous to what happened in Hicks, where they recorded the serial numbers, they moved them, the speakers or the stereo components recorded the serial numbers, and that was considered a search that was unlawful. So, for all those reasons, uh, I think the court should find that, that we have a set of uh, we have met our burden under Franks, and that the motion to suppress should be granted. Thank you. The court, all right. Given your arguments and my need to look at the transcripts, I'm not sure I will have a decision for you on this issue on the 22nd. But we will certainly have some, um, and I will see you then. Is there anything else uh, from either party? Uh, Attorney Kratz, no. Attorney Strain, no, Your Honor, thank you. The court, if not, we're adjourned for today. Proceedings concluded.